presentations and, and Monty came to one of our uh, meetings and we started chatting and everything and he's got an amazing sort of, um, it's, a, it's, it's, it's a really cool, um, interesting um, presentation and also theme as well. I'm really excited to listen to it. So, uh, um, Excellent. Yeah. So are we going on the live stream now? Uh, in about a minute. In about a minute. Okay. okay. Yeah. Um, should we wait or should we go around and do intros? Because we're just pulling up. Let's do it. Yeah. 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 Go ahead, Chris. You start us off. Yeah, Give us the uh, template. Chris Kubre, I work for Ph Data. Um, I'm a machine learning architect. Um, I, I work remotely, so it's all always very nice. Um, before that, I was uh, a machine learning engineer for about six years. Um, and then before that, I was a quant developer. Nice. I'm Drew. Uh, Currently starting my own uh, company that's focused on dealing and managing with message queues, so like SQS, routing queue, active and queue. Uh, and I'm always trying to wrap my head around the ML stuff, so I thought if I could come and just see how people are using it and how people are thinking of it, even if it's not related to you, it'd be super helpful. Cool. So before that, I ran a, a search engine company here in town called Bonza. Uh, talk search. I'm Zach Angelo. Um, I'm working on a new startup called Mixlayer. We're um, a hosted cloud platform for record databases and LLM applications. I feel so underwhelmed by the company non founder here. Um, I'm a student of uh, I'm a founding software architect at a sort of digital mortgage lender, a property tech company called Tomo. Um, been there like around three years at Microsoft before that. If you go to startups, long tail out before that. Um, Bulk of my experience is more than the SDE side, but I do some forays the SRE as well, and I also put a gazillion, or at least a gazillion number of ML products into production in you know, conjunction with our data science teams and so on. So, um, excited to be here, and I know Monty from some consulting work and other projects years back. Yeah, I'm Jeffrey, I'm a software engineer, uh, most of the web stuff, and I'm really interested in machine learning. Excellent. Keith, uh, I'm VP of Engineering at a small startup, EGS Technologies. We're currently in the geospatial augmented reality uh, space, but uh, very interested in just learning about ML, uh, whether there's direct applications to us currently or not. Just interested in growing in general. Learning in general. Um, my name is Christian, and I work both with or do the BI and AI stuff for my company. Which sounds a little weird, um, but also really like um, most open source ML products and projects. Um, so that's what I tend to do outside of my actual work. Actual work. That's such a tough boundary. Like I, I, the older I get, I think the more you get, the more even more blurry it gets. Like where does work begin and fun begin? <laughs> where does life end and death begin? I don't know. It's sort of ridiculous, but. All right, well, let's, let's jump in. I want to, um, uh, I just want to have fun with you guys tonight. It's sort of funny, I haven't done talk, I used to do talking uh, about things. Uh, I was a lawyer, actually, for a weird uh, side stint in my life, and so I was always talking, that's what lawyers do. And, um, and I did it for a long time, and then um, first presentation I gave in quite a while uh, was in October uh, at Harvard Medical School talking about complexity in life sciences research. And um, that was a little intimidating, but I gotta tell you, this room is much more intimidating to me. Because I'm like, you know, I used to be a developer back before there was even DevOps, right? So it's been a long, long time since I was like actively coding, except for, you know, like, I don't know, trying to get my, uh, my, my you know, smart remote to work on my, complex stereo equipment, things like that. But um, um, so, so I'm, I'm living and breathing a lot of this operation stuff, but I'm also like the executive now who's, you know, trying to talk intelligently about it without really knowing shit. So that's, you know, that's why you can call me on anything and I will appreciate it because I love learning and tough questions. And if I don't know the answer, that's great. That gives me something to go explore and you know, maybe have another conversation with you later. All right, so um, 
I'll tell you a little bit about me, but basically this is our buddies. Um, this is a this is such a weird and interesting photo. One of um, my team found this and like put it in as our like header page on our his draft of our investor deck. And I'm like, no, I don't. No, I'm not sure it's, how that's going to go. But for this talk, it's actually perfect because what we're this is like what's going on, and this is a perfect example of like what is so complex. So this guy, um, this guy has got see this thing going in here. There's, there's some stuff going on where, um, in this case, I believe that's a NeuroPixels probe. So a NeuroPixels probe has 384 um, little electrodes that are inserted into the outer cranium of, of a rodent, in this case. And you can actually have, we, we do a lot of work with um, the Allen Institute, they have some experiments that we're working and running for them where they actually have six of those. So you've got like over a thousand, like 1800, whatever, you can do the math, uh, individual electrodes in the brain recording simultaneously. And so what does that mean? Well, okay, what they're doing is, and they're not like, they're, they're recording from each one from a different location uh, around the brain. And there's, and the brain is, you know, You've got whatever, you know, millions of cells all kind of going off um, with action potentials, spikes, right? And so you have millions and millions of spikes, and you have all these electrodes that are simultaneously recording. And you can imagine that an electrode in this position of the brain, an electrode on this position of the brain, are when there's a spike at like one, one, wherever it is in the brain, like it might be hurt, kind of heard and recorded differently at these different points. Well, now you've got like, hundreds or a couple thousands of these points where you're recording and you know this flurry of activity in the brain what happens is that each of these action potentials has like a certain shape but um, based on where the electrodes are that shape kind of looks differently because of how it gets kind of how all the electrical noise it basically is a bunch of noise right but in the noise are these spikes and so there's this thing they call it spike sorting but it's really like one of the most complex uh, algorithms I've ever seen and I'm not sure if it's AI or if it's signal processing engineering or ML or what I don't know what to call it but it's it's very, it's it's almost like magic what it does is it'll say it'll recognize the shape of an action potential and it'll see that same shape but not just on one electrode across hundreds of electrodes right so it'll it'll recognize this shape like a 384 dimensional like time series uh, here's what this little spike looks like, and then it'll pattern match that against an entire time series of recording. It might be an hour long of data, right? And it'll say, oh, well, this spike, whenever I see this shape across these 384 dimensions, that's, you know, cell number one, whatever. And, that's, and then this one is cell number two, and we can go up to about 10,000. So one set of 384 um, um, electrodes in the one probe can distinguish about 10,000 cells. I think that's right. Um, it might be the six pro version does. But in any case, you can, you can record from about, you can identify, like uniquely identify 10,000 neurons at a time and which ones are activating. And you can use, you can then do that, take this and use it to map the activity that's going on. And really what the game is, I'm getting a little ahead of myself, but really what the game is, is try to figure out we're, we're really trying to, well, I'll tell you in a second, we're really trying to figure out, like, well, how does the brain work? Um, okay, so this is me. Um, I've been at, you know what, this was the most fun slide to make, because I realized I've been at a lot of places that have animal logos. And it really, like... I'm not sure I understand. I don't understand. <laughs> Thank you, Siri. You know, Siri gets more intelligent every day. <laughs> so, um... Probably most uh, most relevant here is uh, Fandor, which was where I was working when Zach and I connected back in 2010. Um, I've, there's a lot of things not here. These are all the things that anybody had ever heard of uh, that I ever did. But um, I'm currently working. I, I do some advisory work with 1517 Fund, and you know they're great. Um, and um, McKinsey was a long time ago. Um, and you know the skunk is my favorite, really. That was at Lockheed and. That was when I was still a scientist. So I was doing science at Lockheed, designing stealth aircraft in the end of the Cold War, and I was in the AI lab there. And this is before you know the long 
well, maybe it was in the middle of the long AI desert when AI was uninvestable for 20 or 30 years. And so I was like, ah, getting out of this business. Uh, nobody's doing anything in AI. We were doing composites manufacturing for advanced airframes and scheduling optimization. And it's funny because there's this rise of, just an aside, this rise of, you know, it's not rise of, I mean, it's, machine learning has been a term used for what, like 10 years, 15 years, something like that maybe? I don't know when that was starting to, to be used, but everything I've ever seen in machine learning was like what we were doing at Lockheed in the 80s, it was operations research and it's mm -hmm. simulated annealing. And I did this, I did this thing where the, like, my favorite part of the Skunk Works was um, I had the SR-71 Blackbird, I had the, um, the 3D model of the thing, the, the, the digital files, and um, we weren't allowed to do anything with that. But I was able to like take a slice through the cockpit like this, that it just like goes like this. Take a slice through the cockpit, which has got this bulbous sort of dome and then these really thin edges. Slice through, spin it around uh, the, the vertical axis, and it's the perfect flying saucer. So it made this flying saucer model. And I had um, the software that was actually used to build the F-117 uh, stealth fighter in the 70s with the Skunk Works design. Um, and that was running on like this old Vax 8600 or something like that. And uh, it would take about a week. And the reason the Stealth Fighter has all those, you know, the facets, right? This is very faceted. It looks like a jewel kind of, except it's black and it's hard to see. Um, is because that was the largest computer model they could run at the time. Like that was the maximum number of facets they could get through the high frequency radar analysis. It was pretty funny. So like, ah, well, we can't run anymore, so we better just stop there and design from there. So that's what they did. But then what we did is, so I had a, I had a connection machine, a thinking machines, a uh, supercomputer, and my job, this is my first job out of college, I was, hey, we, we gotta run circles around the, the Cray YMP with this new device, and uh, it was a blast. And so we were actually able to run the software that, that ran the stealth, uh, the F-117 stealth fighter. We were able to run it in like 30 frames per second, 30 iterations per second. And so we put an optimization algorithm around it, and you could actually change the surface coatings in, you know, in sort of in real time and try everything. And so we were doing this like, um, I don't remember if it was simulated annealing or genetic algorithm, but we did this algorithm of optimization where we were, you know, like you heat it up, it must have been simulated annealing, because you heat it up and you find, you know, you find the peaks of like the lowest radar cross section, and then you like, you cool it down, and then you heat it up again and you get more noise and keep finding, you know, better, better optimum, um, you know, uh, solutions. And uh, so we, uh, we made this video, um, well, and I presented this at a IEEE conference, and there were these two guys in the back from the Air Force. This is so like weirdly like the Reagan era, right? There were these two guys. I met them a couple of different times. They were from Wright Patterson Air Force Base, and the first, like each time I met them, I, they gave me a different name. Like these guys were total spooks, and they were. Um, they were very upset. Well, we, this was like there was nothing classified about anything we showed, but we showed this flying saucer that was getting less, getting more and more and more and more invisible until it vanished, right? With this algorithm running on top of it, and they jumped up and ran out of the room and went to phone calls. But you know, anyway, so all right, so this is what we're doing, and I do have Pinky in the brain. They're my favorites. What do you want to do tonight, Brian? Anything we do every night, we're going to try to reverse engineer the brain. Um, which is probably a better quote for pinky than for brain, but that's okay. Um, so that's what, like, that's, what, that's what we're working on. That's what Data Joint came out of. There was this project called Microns, um, which was an IARPA, which is a DARPA-related thing, I think, in um, the 2009-2010 era. It was about a $100 million project, with, um, which was about um, uh, sort of mapping the brain, the structure, and the function of the brain to look at how do cortical networks function and what can we learn about the algorithms that the brain uses for pattern matching. And this fantastic study, uh, massive, massive amounts of data, what they actually did is they had a cubic millimeter of a mouse's brain, which is actually like in a mouse, that's, it's a lot. It's a big chunk of cortex, right? So they mapped, a, well, I think it's a cubic millimeter of the brain, and they did an entire, like, you know, electron mic microscopy of it, where they had all the structure. So every, every neuron link, physical link mapped. Uh, but before they did that, they actually ran all of this um, electrophysiology and other um, uh, 
you know, physiology work on the brain and how were the networks working and what were they, what was responding to what. So this massive, massive data set, uh, the very first papers are only just now about to be published. They're in preprints right now and they're coming out like in the next year. There's gonna be a giant issue of nature which goes through like, you know, this, it's, 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 it's maybe not at quite as big a deal as the Human Genome Project was for genetics because that kind of solved a lot of things. This is like almost like a first step in that direction in neuroscience. So we're at this really very fascinating time, sort of a cusp. So right after that, um, the NIH uh, funded a, um, a new initiative in, in the Obama administration, it was 2013, called the Brain Initiative. And the Brain Initiative has poured billions of dollars into, primarily into, developing new technologies for, under, for like measuring activity in the brain. And uh, you know, in, in the world of uh, um, healthcare and uh, pharmaceuticals and research, uh, one of the things um, I recently discovered is that, so oncology is like the biggest area, all everything relating to cancer. Neuroscience is number two, and it's about 10% of all research is uh, neuroscience, neurology, and that includes things like Alzheimer's and epilepsy and um, uh, Parkinson's, uh, conditions like that, but also things like, you know, why, like one of the researchers I, I, um, I got to know a little bit at Rice University is studying, he's doing his PhD on um, the nature of curiosity and how, why is it that people, like, as they age, sometimes many people just get less curious about new things? And is this something that we can actually, like, understand the mechanisms in the brain? And, you know, I don't know, maybe it's going to make great drugs out of it, or maybe it's going to, you know. But, it, but like, who knows what it leads to, right? But, there's, but it's a fascinating question. There's another project we're working on that I think we're going to um, start on early next year, which is involving six universities around the world, four experimental labs and two theoretical labs that are looking, that, are, that have these two competing theories for consciousness and like how does consciousness actually show up in the brain and only one of them can be true and we're actually like refereeing, the, kind of referee this study and you know, manage all the data and it's very, it's very, very cool. So the kinds of range of questions are, um, are fascinating. But with all of these, right, like the real issue is, you know, the, the chaos in the operational realm. Because like, so this is, a, this is like an example of like what some of the research is like. So Houghton uh, Liu, Professor Liu at Indiana, this is um, kind of a, a, a really lovely, very simplified diagram of like what her research is. So they've got three different sources of time series data. And then there's another, a fourth, which is, um, uh, stimulation. So if there's any stimulation or whatever's in the environment of the mouse, you might be like, a lot of times they're watching a video. Dimitri Arsenio said the mice loved, um, um, they loved the Matrix, but the one that they really liked, <laughs> they, did, they loved the Matrix. I actually, like, when I was in the lab at, at Baylor, like, they were watching, like, clips of Neo uh, doing, doing his crazy stuff. Uh, but the one they really liked, the one they really liked was, um, was Mad Max, the new Mad Max. Not the old, I don't know if they watched Mel Gibson, but they probably don't like Mel, but they like the new Mad Max. Anyway, so what we're, what we're doing here, so in the lab, they've got two photon calcium imaging. What this is, these mice are um, genetically engineered so that their neurons will fluoresce when they're, when they're uh, depolarized, when the membrane's depolarized, they'll fluoresce in response to infrared light. So you shine an infrared laser in and you get green or you know, blue or something out, right? So uh, that's a very technical description of two photon calcium imaging. I'm not going to try to do that. But so the two photon calcium imaging generates, and, and so you've got a laser, and these lasers are, you know, guided and have an incredibly fast scan rate. So you're actually able, and then based on the intensity of the laser, it can go deeper and deeper into the brain. So you're actually able to generate these like layers. It's like an of MRI kind of sort of Kind of, but like, but like but live and mm. and at like you know extremely high frequency. I mean, we're talking at least thirty or sixty or maybe it's even one hundred twenty. I don't remember what the number is, but like frames per second. So you're getting you know these these very very high resolution scans of like you'll you'll see these areas in the scan. I should have a photo of it in here, but I'm not sure I do. 
but you'll see these like the, you'll see the neurons and they just sort of they light up when they're when they're activated and then you can get these scans of many 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 like uh, horizontal planes and so you have this you know this great basically video data of multiple planes over over time at, you know many frames per second um, of what's what are the which cells are active so that's the two photon. And then you've got the body movement. And so here, this is video. So you've got the mouse on one or two or maybe three, depending on your setup, on video cameras where you're f sort of filming its behavior. And if the mouse is like kind of in a, a little bit like constrained, like it's just on a track ball walking, they do this. They have a mouse VR where it's like a, you know, put Mad Max in 3D around it, it's on the track ball. And, um, and so you're filming the mouse. A lot of times you'll film from underneath so you can see its paws and where is it moving. Uh, and you also film often its, its face so you can see its, its whiskers and its eyes and where is it looking. And in this case, they're, they're doing whisker movement. A lot of times they'll also do pupil tracking. There's like, there's like 18 different modalities. Each one of these is a, a modality. It's a different type of time series. So then each of these is this massive amount of data. And now we've got to coordinate that and we have to process it. So like the whisker movement, we use the face map software, which actually measures like the movement of the whiskers. It actually gives you, instead of, you know, a video, which is hard to interpret, it gives you some, some data that you can actually, uh, I don't know exactly how it works, but I imagine they like number the whiskers and tell you X, Y, you know, movements. Body movement, deep lab cut is really cool. This, this, um, there's a, there's a couple of new ones in this market too. This, this is called pose estimation. And this is an AI that um, will take like a body. It could be human, it could be mouse, whatever. Take a body, and then it basically it does motion capture. It gives you the position of all the limbs and joints and whatever. So you'll have the map of like here's the tail, and, but it basically gives you these like X Y Z coordinates of all of the positions of the limbs or of the nose, the eyes, the ears, whatever whatever it is that you're you're tracking. And so the way it typically works is like you'll have the video, you'll kind of curate a few key scenes, and the AI learns from that and does an interpretation and you check it and then now you've got a, a time series of every joint. So like I saw a lab um, a couple weeks ago at the uh, SFN, the Neuroscience uh, Conference in DC. Um, this is in a, this is a rehab hospital and they're using data joints to power their, um, uh, their analysis and they're using, they have video cameras in like in the hallways and they've got patients who are, you know, some use a walker or whatever, walking down the halls and they're able to take the video and identify the patient and then they can actually like, through the pipeline that they've built, take the video, process it, do all of this pose estimation, getting all the positions of the joints, and from that, they can actually like, have an analysis at the back end of that, and this is right where the science really happens, right? That last piece was, now we could actually chart like a person's, like a stroke, uh, like a stroke victim, like their, their recovery of like recovering, you know, movement ability, and do they hit a plateau or do they continue to recover, right? Um, I think there were six different labs doing this kind of thing um, with this kind of data. They were, they could detect Parkinson's. So you could have a group of mice where you have some control who were not infected and some that were, and the video alone can actually determine the very early, early, early onset. They're doing that with Alzheimer's, they're doing it with epilepsy, all different things. So really cool what's, what's happening in this realm. And actually here uh, in, in Houston at Methodist, they're using that same software with the Houston Astros to like break down the swing of the batter and figure out when can we put this guy back on the field and back in play and, and it's safe. It's not gonna like exacerbate the injury. So anyway, so we've got all these time series data and then you know, so you've got, this doesn't line it up the way, the way that I like, but what, the way I think of it is there's a stimulus. The mouse sees something in its environment, sees a cricket and wants to go eat it or whatever. I see crickets, but something like that. And then, and then the brain, right? In the brain, what happens? Well, oh, there's, a, there's some, some visual. It's going gonna, it's gonna to process. The brain will process in the video or the, the, the vision, right? The sensory input. And then it'll have to interpret that and then it'll make a, a decision, and then it'll take some action. And then the action shows up in the behavior, right? And so there's this time series of all this information, and then the science is like, get that information in a form that's actually like, that you can work with. You know, it's not giant videos, it's got some data and things that you can 
create sort of hypotheses. And all these are represented in software. So you have hypotheses and you test them and you develop your you know, charts and visualizations and analyses to see what works. So that's, that's this complexity, right? And so here's what we've got. You've got like petabytes of this time series data. We are trying to map like the physiology and the behavior in time, try to create a, a story about cause and effect, right? You've got, uh, this is crazy. So all of these tools that you see in here, they're all open source. Deep Lab Cuts developed by um, um, Mackenzie Mathis, her lab um, in Switzerland, in the EU, and um, maybe not in the EU, anyway, in Europe. And um, there's a bunch of these. Like we, and, and there's new ones, it seems like, every day. We have uh, a couple of labs at Harvard, a couple of labs at Duke, a um, couple others where they've got these open source tools. They're, they would like them to get disseminated. They'd like them to get used, but it's actually really hard. If, if you're, um, if you're going to try and take some open source tool, like you've got, you guys know this, right? I mean, it's all the whole DevOps problem of, oh, do I have all the right versions of you know, Python and all the libraries? And what does this thing require? And is it even maintained and supported? And oh, crap, a new version came out. Now it doesn't work anymore. And like, you know, there's just, it's, it's, it's impossible for any one lab to try to keep up, especially when you've got like two or three of these tools, like you got all these different modalities, and you want to try to make these things work together. It's just not worth it. I mean, we talked to, I, I talked to a bunch of students at Harvard um, when I talked there last month, and like, in their words at least, it was like having to figure out this stuff themselves to use like the kind of cutting edge technology was gonna add two years to their like time to get a PhD. Uh, massive cost, right? And then this is really the cool thing is that like, there's a lot happening in the world of AI and machine learning and there's massive promise to apply all of this technology to medical research because what, you know, can we accelerate the rate of discovery? Can we, you know, can we find out something about Alzheimer's, hopefully cure it or prevent it before it hits me, you know? <laughs> And you, and I, you guys are all young. So for you guys are probably all okay for a little longer. But still, <laughs> you still want this cure. We all want that one because that is the scariest thing. It's scarier than death to me, is to be incapacitated and unable to think. And, and remember, I have so many lovely, wonderful people in my life, and I don't want to forget them. That's the scariest goddamn thing. So anyway, sorry for a moment of vulnerability. But, um, so there's a couple things here that are really cool. So with all that's going on in AI, um, there's like really, I mean, I can boil it down to three. There's really three big opportunities that I am excited about and we need to get ready for it. One is closed loop, which is experiments that actually in real time, where instead of having to like take all your data, go process it, figure it out, and then go, you do, an, go do another experiment, where we can actually like uh, improve and test and generate hypotheses, test them and iterate them in real time. Kind of like what we did in 1989 with the Stealth Fighter SR-71 model, but doing this with actual live brains and data. And we're going to talk about that at the end if I don't run out of time. And then inference engines, there's a lot like, I mean, Palantir, those guys are doing amazing work and there's a bunch, a bunch of, you know, the big tech guys. Palantir is the one I got my money on, I think, that are looking at massive data sets. Palantir's been doing this with, um, you know, uh, uh, intelligence community data and military data and the, the richness and the complexity of, you know, all the human communications and all that is, is insane. But, you know, so is the brain, right? And all of the data that we're working with, you know, across, across, um, you know, multiple different studies, right? There's so much data and every, any one of these studies is incredibly complex. But now we have, well, if there's a way that we could actually look across all of the work that's being done in, a, in an area, um, or like, like at MD Anderson, they have the richest set of oncology data in the world. They just announced the, I think it's a $100 million new initiative last month. The, um, um, it's the, uh, um, what do they call it? It's basically the, the initiative for data science in oncology. And what they're doing is pouring a ton of capital into systems, into AI and machine learning and data science around their massive, massive wealth of data about you know, 
tumors and patients and conditions and how they develop and treatments and everything. And so there's like incredible promise to actually like have breakthroughs come out of you know AI and data science tools being applied to that data. But of course, like that data is hard to get your head around if it's not organized well, and most of it isn't. And then the third area, which is like the simplest one, it's the one I'm most excited about uh, in a way because it's probably the most imminent for for us, we're gonna be implementing this in the next uh, few months, which is, hey, I got a complex science experiment. I just wanna ask questions about it. Like, I want an LLM that can understand all of my data and my pipeline, and it can, you know, even just like, hey, where is the data about, you know, mouse 37? Or mm -hmm. where is the, like, you know, who showed up and did any work in my lab last week? These kinds of questions. Most, most scientists, so, uh, most scientists, like, just don't have access and don't have the knowledge in a massive data set to find stuff easily. So even just like having an intelligent domain specific search about a single experiment is like a huge game changer. That's what I'm building. So yeah? yeah? Well, awesome. So maybe we can partner on that. Because like, uh, I'm actually, okay, actually let's talk about this. Yeah. I am filing for a grant okay, cool. in January, um, January 5th, and that's one of our key aims and Maybe we can have you on it as a collaborator. Let's talk about that because that could be, you know, not nice, nice set of non-dilutive funding from NIH, which is, I, I mean, honestly, like the best, the other best thing about this. Let me talk about this. So, the chaos in the labs. There's no standards um, at all, and there's almost no systems. The system is, I got a hard drive, I've got a bunch of data. I'm going to plug it into this laptop, which is configured <laughs> with like. Uh, this, you know, this algorithm and all of these Python libraries and all that, and run, you know, I'm going to go to the Bash shell, run this thing, and give it whatever parameters. Okay, great. Now I unplug that. Now I go to this laptop, which is configured with this other, you know, set of Python libraries. And oh no, this one's MATLAB, so you know, it's actually got to be Windows. Or something. You know, it's crazy. So you're moving from laptop to laptop, environment to environment, and that's actually like the better labs. Um, you know, the scary thing is there was one lab we walked into one of our customers at um, a very large university in New York that might have the name of the city in it. And um, the metadata in this lab that, you know, you want to think about putting an AI across this. Okay, all the metadata about the mice was on handwritten post-it notes slapped on the mouse, mouse cages. And like, okay, yeah, what's an AI do with that? I mean, I guess you could run it through like a video capture and <laughs> is uh, handwriting recognition? No. Are systems like uh, GitHub or Git incre like completely foreign to labs, or is there a small amount of penetration? You know, um, there's, there's, it's funny that you ask that. So I created like, when I was doing like my user personas for our customers, um, I created like the Venn diagram of like, well, there's the scientists who know how to use GitHub and are comfortable with it, and then there's the scientists who don't. And like that's the biggest distinction between these two groups. Is it's a very easy one to say like, oh yeah, sure, I know how to do a git merge or like GitHub. What is you know, what is that? And and it's not quite that bad, but but it is shocking the number of times we've had like a support call from a customer about like how to use GitHub. And um, yeah, the level of knowledge is. Uh, is it, 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 there's an extremely wide range because you do have people who are like the tool developers and these guys are great coders and um, they're at least often at least great like scientific software engineers which is what I used to be in the 80s doing the Lockheed stuff but that doesn't mean I was great at like uh, you know database administration I had no idea what SQL was I didn't learn SQL for like I don't know five ten years after that and, and even then, it was SQL. I mean, that was weird. Okay, so there's no standards. Um, every lab, they always are rolling their own thing. You know, it's experimental science. It's an art, you know? So that's one of the obstacles. There's frequent change. Often, you know, you're experimenting. I'm going to change out the equipment. I'm going to try a new version of the code, or I'm going to write some code. A lot, of, a lot of these guys are writing their own code, their own scripts, and all the analysis that happens once you have the data, that's all custom work done by the scientists. So everybody's a coder at some level. And working on creating visuals, the, the charts and graphics that these guys create, they're, they're wizards at like Plotly and you know um, all that stuff. So there's that. And then this one's really interesting. So NIH has adopted new regulations last January requiring labs to publish their data 
and make it shareable. And what's uh, what's kind of nutty, there's like this, I don't know, you know, it depends how, how heavy a stick they apply, but they're basically saying, if you have any grant funded research, you have to, you're, when you publish your study in the journal, you have to simultaneously publish all the data that you used in the study and all the data that you collected and didn't use. And this is like, I mean, you saw we're talking about petabytes, right? This is a massive undertaking for labs to do this. And I think the scientists are a little bit maybe in denial about what that requires, but like the administrators in all the universities who are in charge of like risk and getting those, you know, keeping that, that, that money train running. Um, and, you know, they get audited. They actually have to work, work on this. And so this is a challenge. I think the coolest thing I've learned in the last two years working with Data Joint is that, so I came into it as kind of diehard, libertarian, skeptical about government and anything it ever did. I lived in DC for about a, about a decade and was doing regulatory law. So, you know, kind of rubbed <laughs> off, seeing too much of that. But, um, but I came into it thinking, oh, government funded research, what a disaster. And you know what, I, I feel like um, what I've seen is that the NIH has been really thinking about this and really ahead of the curve. Um, they've, been, they've been investing, they've, I mean, they've been funding data joint and they've been, you know, expanding that funding over the last few years, um, really seeing that there are these problems with data management and DevOps and, and all of this in this realm and that we need solutions and that it's really critical to science being or becoming, again, reliable, repeatable and, you know, restoring public trust. Okay, just a couple other quick things. In pharma, Gartner uh, did, did a study. If you look across all job categories, um, you, you can actually like count how many different pieces of software or applications does a person have to deal with. And the researchers in the pharma industry are like 10x or more number of applications that they deal with compared to any other Industry. And that's because of this proliferate, all that you saw the complexity of the research. It's also just the number of uh, different tools you have to use. Some of them are open source, some are scripts or code that they write, right? So there's, you know, kind of homegrown code, code from the guy down the hall, code from the university across the street, uh, you know, the, the proliferation of code. And it's sort of fascinating that this is true versus not just you know, researchers versus the rest of pharma, but versus any other market, including, you know, any kind of, you know, uh, uh, chemical or, um, um, what's the other big one? There's a couple other really big ones, but, um, but pharma's like way out ahead. And then there's like great studies on this stuff, like biologists, 60% of them, they can't even reproduce their own results on when somebody else's. If you ask about trying to reproduce somebody else's result, that goes up to 70 something. And then like, there's a great data set where, um, a researcher at um, ooh, Penn, I think it was, I'm not sure where he was, but he published this study, did this automated study, he keeps updating it, um, looking at uh, peer-reviewed articles in the leading journals, we're talking like nature, we're not talking the second or third tier journals, and like 30% or more of the papers have fundamental data errors because of, the, get this, the cause on, on this particular uh, analysis was easy to find. It was because of the use of Microsoft Excel for data management. If you paste your data, if you bring a CSV file into Microsoft Excel, and it has anything that looks like a date, guess what? It gets interpreted as a date, then you save the file and it's changed your data. It's, it's saved it as a, as, a, as a number, a digital version of the date. And that, in genetics data, is an absolute disaster. In fact, the Genetics Whatever Industry Association petitioned Microsoft and I don't know why you didn't fix this for us, Stephen. They petitioned Microsoft about five years ago about this problem, saying like, hey, we can't seem to get all the geneticists to like, uh, you know, whatever, put their gen genetic name, gene, the gene marker names or whatever in quotes or whatever it needed to do. We can't get them to do that. Can you change Excel? And Microsoft just <laughs> said no. And, um, and so, but apparently Google Docs, Google Sheets uh, may not have this problem. So. Who knows? Maybe we're going to actually see, you know, Google taking market shares. Didn't they Probably change, not. Like, some of the notation? This is what they did. So, so yeah, they exactly. This is what they did. The genetics, that industry association, they basically threw up their hands and they said, "Well, let's just change the, the names of those genes." 
Okay, we'll just rename them because we can't like, we'll rename them so that it's not like M-A-R-3 because that looks like March 3rd, but like, okay, great. So they changed the names of the genes. You know what? Turns out nobody listens to the Genetics Industry Association who are, none of the, you know, Microsoft didn't. Neither did the geneticists. So, because like we're still seeing today roughly this like 30%, 31% errors in all these papers. It's insane. And you know, we're wasting billions of dollars. That's enough to say on that. And then waste billions of dollars in R&D. Like what's, what, how do we waste it? That is being wasted. Well, okay. So for example, NIH, uh, there was a study on Alzheimer's, a uh, set of studies in somewhere in the Midwest, I forget what the university was. was it, this came out a couple, two, three years ago, um, where like the fundamental, like the image, the brain images that were used in this study, this was a study, I think it involved amyloid plaques, and um, basically these images were, were faked or photoshopped, yeah. right? And that came out, but this, there was a set of studies and they were like, there was a whole scandal around it. We're like, well, the, the, the guy that published the study, the peer review was a guy that used to work in his lab, you know, and this whole, this whole thing. And, um, it, but this was like a really fundamental, important study. And there was a couple of billion dollars of NIH funded research, mm. like that came out of that, like out of that study. Now, I don't know that all of it is invalid, but if there's fundamental questions about like that initial thing, everything has to be, yeah. you have to go back and redo it all. Yeah. And, and or you know. Further studies on it, right? Yeah. It's just a disaster. So this guy, I love this guy, Mark uh, Tessie Levine, uh, president of Stanford, resigned in July. Neuroscientist, he uh, had done work with, um, I think it was Genentech, don't want to, Libel them, so I won't say that for sure. But uh, a number of his labs, um, there was concerns about his integrity, about the integrity in his research. But you know what? There was no fraud. They actually hired a U.S. attorney to go do this, like big, you know, investigation of what happened. And um, he didn't know what was in his data. He didn't adequately supervise his postdocs and his grad students, his teams. But like fundamentally, like you know what? You've seen kind of like the volume, the crazy. Like, what, how much data is being generated? How could you even know what's in it? It's almost impo an impossible task. So in the market today, seeing things like the president of Stanford resigns and he had to withdraw seven or eight of his, you know, seminal papers uh, from earlier in his career. Um, you see these kinds of impacts on people's lives and on their reputations. And if you're the president of a university or of a medical school, or even just a principal investigator in a lab, your reputation could be destroyed by what like students are doing, and you're not really watching what they're doing every minute, right? So what do you do? So this is a big, this is a crisis. And part of the crisis, like, hey, this is like not, this is in The Guardian, right? People read this, uh, it was in all the newspapers, right? I mean, public trust in science. You know, we have all of, all, we have so many great examples of like, you know, science, Science is supposed to be like facts and believable, and it's become politicized in one realm, we're not gonna talk about that, but like even just reliability of research, can you really believe? Because like, hey, what happens is if I make a breakthrough finding, a breakthrough is what gets me my next job, what gets me tenured, what's get me, what gets me grants. And it's like, it's so tied to financial rewards. And that's just tough. So like, we need a revolution in science operations, and this is what we think is missing. This is my favorite little uh, diagram. You know, most, most scientists have the skills up here and coming down into like data science, some of them into a bit of computer science, but like this chunk, this is the dev DevOps, like there'd be dragons here, right? DevOps lives in here and um, you know, the, the AI and ML ops, kind of lives in here. But then what's what, like, there's this piece, which is where we are trying to build, uh, you know, our sort of team and our skill set and kind of a vision of this new category. One of the guys that um, we know from Gartner was uh, around at the beginning in like 2009. And he wrote the first Wikipedia page for DevOps. He wrote the first entry about what is DevOps. And so I'm hoping to work with him next year and write the first page for PsyOps, because it's a new thing. And, you know, the, the thing, you know, it's, it's a lot like DevOps. I mean, this is actually what I wanted to ask you guys. Like, so this is like, we think about DevOps and you can think about ML and AI as well. But like, 
this is all really important pieces of how do we achieve like rapid, reliable, high quality, you know, software and keep it alive and running, right? So science is like this. Science needs all of that, especially with all this data. But there's a couple other pieces, like there's all of the, all of this is generally about like code management and execution and, you know, DevOps, I mean, I guess, do you guys think of data ops as like a sort of a separate or adjacent field or is data ops kind of part of DevOps? This is one of the things I've been struggling about thinking, thinking through, you know, or is it just all ops? What do you think, Sam? You look like you have an opinion. The environments I've been in DevOps is separate from data ops. Yeah. Too, too big silos because the things that your, uh, your data engineers are doing mm -hmm. tend to be like ad hoc researchery type mm -hmm. things where there's, there's, yeah, you're using the same redshift clusters to do your analytics and mm -hmm. whatever you're considering mm -hmm. it, your, your yeah. thing, and you're doing stuff. But it's, it's sort of an ad hoc, let's go research that study. Mm -hmm. it. Like you got a question, some executive, whoever asked you a question and you're trying to go like figure out the answer from all that, from yeah. a set of data. I mean, in, in machine That's learning, a, you, the, the, if you've got mm -hmm. bad data, then it's complete garbage. Mm -hmm. So r really, the, 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 the way to design a pipeline so that you get strong signals and, mm -hmm. and, and, and good um, you know, forecasts out of the models, mm -hmm. it, it really is part of the data. Yeah. One of the things, so a question about that. One of the things that I've seen in a lot of the context of ML ops in like, in a lot of enterprise data, at least. You know, you're looking at business BI type data, right? Um, and when you're, when you're doing learning in that environment, a lot of times you'll just like, you'll get a data set. Like I'll take an extract, I'll run a big query or whatever. I'll take a bunch of data out of my, you know, my whatever repositories, wherever it's stored, and I'll create a data set. And then I'll go and try to look for, you know, look for patterns in that. Um, how different is, and like, I guess what I'm wondering is about, about is like, where is it that that is sort of the mode versus a mode where you're like dealing with um, sort of like more dealing with all that data in real time? You know, do you see that as, a, as an well, important I mean, distinction in the when process? When you're prototyping the models, it's definitely more sort of a research type mm -hmm. thing. But once that model is in production, mm -hmm. then it really is mm -hmm. just trying to understand, well, is, is, there, is there good data? It, are, there, are there problems with the data? Do you need a mitigate it, mm -hmm. um, you, you know, it's, it's, it's part of the whole thing then, right? yeah. when it's in production. So are you putting that, when you're, in, when, you're, when you're talking about like in production, are you then putting that on top of like real time transaction data or batch and so forth? Right, right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. I think what you're talking about is like training and inference. Uh, I think in training is there's a life cycle in the mm -hmm. That's a good word. That's a that's a good word. The life cycle, like you know, and there's different operate different kinds of ops have different kinds of life cycles. Yeah, yeah. Right. Like, and there's different. Like, I would imagine, like, if I'm a friend of mine works on the autopilot uh, team at Tesla, and you know what, they got a bunch of like regulatory concerns that aren't there in a lot of like 
ML ops, right? Because they've got if they're if they're training of the of the models, cause you know later that model whatever drives my car into a tree, right? There's going to be some questions about like, well, why did the you know why did the Tesla drive into the tree? Um, the uh, the there's got to be the ability to go back and kind of reproduce just for like the regulatory yeah. investigation kind of reasons, right? Insurance or whatever, right? So there's a, I would imagine in financial services, you might have some of those kinds of concerns too. I mean, in science we have, this is a big thing, right? Like we've got, like, unlike a lot of areas, PSYOPs, you've got reliability because you want, you're, you're actually gonna like go spend a lot of money or you might go, you know, put pharmaceutical products into this like, you know, crazy expensive, you know, whatever, hundred millions of dollar, like FDA, review process, right? You're making ma major, major decisions or, or care decisions for patients, right? You're making decisions like in the rehab hospital. Hey, if they're not properly analyzing like what they're seeing in the motion of the patients, they're gonna like put the, uh, they're gonna put one of the Houston Astros back on the field before he's ready and he's gonna be out for the whole season and you know, we lose the, because Austin doesn't have a team, so I'm allowed to talk about the Astros. Yeah, okay. That's good. So anyway, but yeah, you know, so we lose the World Series. We don't even make it, right? Anyway, so there's there's concerns about that. Reproducibility is like, okay, can we trust can we trust science without having to always like give the third degree to everybody? And and auditability is a really interesting one. That's one where, you know, we see that in like okay, financial records, whatever. I mean, if you were you're a Walmart, if you can't audit what's going on with your you know, cash register transactions, you'd have all kinds of fraud, you'd lose money. There's a lot of great financial incentives for auditability. Well, guess what? This is coming to big pharma. They're starting to see this traceability requirements in the EU, and it is, it is believed that the FDA is going this way. And so like what we're doing with NIH, of actually, you know, like the, the data management standards for research is like kind of like the predecessor, like if we actually have robust data systems for research and we can actually track all this data, then great, we have a lot better chance of reliability and disability and then being able to explain how we got this answer, which is how you prove that you've got these things, right? It's part of how, part of how you prove it. Um, but the other thing that is very interesting about this picture to me is that I love what you said. What was your name again? Keith. Dean. Keith. Keith, sorry, Keith. Keith said, um, that a lot of, sometimes the analysis is in, on the data ops side, very ad hoc, and you've got your DevOps and your data ops. And um, in science, in order for this to be reliable and reproducible, you, you can't just manage your data. You can have all the data integrity, referential integrity in the world, but you have to do that over time, three years, five years, 10 years, like the Microns project, they're just publishing now, and that was a study that started in you know, around 20, 2010, 2009, 2010, so on like that, right? So what happens if you're like, what happens if your code changes? What happens if that code changes, the code that like took the data from here and transformed and analyzed and processed, right? You change that algorithm or you tweak the code or not even the code, the parameters that you put into the code for how did you want to modify or analyze this batch of data. If you're not tracking that, this is gone. All this is gone. So you have to actually link your code and your data because you're talking about not just the data set, you're talking about the data set as it gets transformed and analyzed and modified and visualized and pattern matched and published. It's tricky, like when you start incorporating AI into this analysis, it gets really tricky because like some of these algorithms are non-deterministic. So like what does it mean? Like what does it mean to have a reproducible like non-deterministic algorithm? That's a Sort of fun philosophical question. All right, here's our CEO, Dimitri. He's amazing. He's my favorite CEO I've ever worked with in my long career with, I don't know, a lot of CEOs. Um, so he invented this thing, the computational database. The best thing that ever happened to science, I think. I don't know, Galileo, or, you know, those guys are good too. <laughs> but like, this is the best one in the big data world, um, is that Dimitri was a, a computer science geek. He um, grew up in Ukraine. Uh, immigrated as um, a teenager, and um, he had three degrees in computer science, and then went into startups, and then he worked in GE Medical, and he worked for a startup in neuroscience, and he was like blown away by all the complexity of like brain research. So he decided to throw away that career and go and do a PhD in neurophysiology at Baylor uh, College of Medicine in Houston. And Dimitri 
like walked in in the early days of this Microns project, and he was, you know, as the, you know, he was like a database scientist in the CS world, a lot of theory around databases, and he walked in and saw the scientific process and what a unmitigated, like, chaos, disaster it was. And so he invented this thing. So Data Joint, the open source framework, he first public, published it, I think it was open source first in like 2009 or 2011, and uh, it's datajoint.com, or you can find it on GitHub. Uh, I have a link later if you wanna like try out the framework, because it's, it's actually pretty cool. So it works like Excel. So you know in Excel, you got a cell, and it can have either data or a formula, and if it's got a formula, it can have references to other cells, and those cells can have formulas, right? And then those cells can have formulas, and so on and so on and so on. And so if you have like a big you know, financial model and you change your discount rate, you can like see it propagate through thousands of cells, and it pretty basically happens without you having to think about it. So Excel is like a transformative, or Lotus 1, 2, 3, or VisiCalc if you're really old like me. Uh, I think I actually had VisiCalc on a computer in the 80s. Uh, anyway. Um, if, if you look at any of those systems, right, they're like, they're magical. And when you think about what is it actually doing, it's like, whoa, that's, that's very cool. It's automatically propagating any change I make, and it's making sure that there's no circular references, and everything's consistent, and, you know, you can even format these things. You can have them show up in, you know, fancy ways. So there's a lot of things, cool things you can do. Um, you can even create visualizations. You can create little spark lines in the cells. And so all kinds of great stuff, right? So Excel has become this very magical, very open-ended tool. Dimitri basically invented a language called Data Joint Python uh, and, and also MATLAB. So there's a Data Joint MATLAB. And it's a framework. It's like Rails is to Ruby. It sits on top of Python. It's a language for expressing um, workflows, data models, and dependencies, and transformations. And so in Data Joint, basically a cell in Excel, which can have either data or a formula, and it shows you the data. In Data Joint, um, replace the idea of a cell with a table, and that's kind of, you're kind of getting an idea for what it is. So in data joint, um, what happens is there's code, and that code, like in our commercial platform, like it's containerized, it runs in uh, the cloud, and we're moving into like HPC capability too. So you've got a container. Certain nodes in your in your graph are, you know, just values. Like this could be, if this was a node in your graph, it could be uh, read from a file or it could be um, manually entered metadata. Uh, but then the ones that are computed have a container that executes and automate, and, like, and, we, and we automate it, right? So what happens is whenever there's a change in an upstream dependency, because you know, these references are basically like uh, pointers to other uh, fields and other tables. And whenever there's a change in an upstream table, um, automatically all of those uh, computations are run and propagated all the way through the pipeline. So it's actually like impossible in data joint to have your data and your code and parameters, uh, depending on how you define the pipeline, you can actually create it so that it's impossible for those things to get out of sync unless you really like hack the system or try. All right, so this is kind of what data joint looks like. This is the, this is like sort of the, the view of the open source, right? So you, you've got these decorators that go onto your uh, your Python classes, and um, one of the things that is like the coolest thing about this is I don't know if I can really show it here. Let me show you in the. Um, it's it's an open source library. Yeah, yeah. Data joints open source, and where is my want the calendar? Yeah, I don't want that. Huh. Maybe you're getting this too much. Sorry. Yeah. Or, where where is my other window? Oh wait, it's over here. Huh. Here's Microns. Here it is. Okay, so this is our this is our, our commercial platform. Just to give you the idea, right? So, um, like in here, this is a, it's just a sample pipeline. But like you've got a subject, and a subject is it's got a name. It's got a Veritra, 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 however you pronounce that, and it's got a nickname and a sex and a birth date, right? So this is like a mouse or a, a monkey or a zebrafish. We do zebrafish. Um, all right, so you've got a subject, right? And then the subject gets included into a session. So you have a session, which is um, got a reference here to your subject. I don't know what this cruft is. That's not supposed to be. 
but you've got a reference to your subject and it's got a date time. So this is, a session is like an experiment, like a recording session, like I took the animal and I put it in front of the matrix and it watched Neo do blah, 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 whatever. And I generated all this data. So the session is the date time and there's also usually notes and various things. And so there's a bunch of, so you can see like, okay, there's notes, right? So notes are hanging off of the session table, right? So you can say, okay, sure, there's a, you know, you, get a, you only can write 1,024 characters of notes in this pipeline. I guess it's gotta be terse, can't say too much. Um, and a bunch, you know, okay, the experimenter, right? So this ties back to, and you can see here, this arrow, and this is all just the very simple, like the data joint syntax. This is how you actually create your pipeline, right? This arrow here is referring to the user, right? So there's a user table, and now it's okay, it's just a reference up to the user. So one of the things that actually kind of makes the magic work here in this system of the, the database tables where you've got propagating computations is that when we get down into like the scan, let's see, which one do I want to show you? Well, let's go down to imaging actually. So in here, if we're looking at like, actually let me flip to this, this is the data layer so we can actually see what's in these tables. This is actually like running live on our not very powerful production, current, current or uh, not production, but the, um, the demo server. Anyway, but um, let's see. So like in here, you'll see, okay, the, um, the columns in here, oops, I don't want to sort that. Oh, that's fine, I can sort it. But, um, actually, let me do this. Let's just make this one full screen. So what you see here, so this table is like a processing task, which is like defining the parameters that it's gonna go run this giant, you know, number crunching, supercomputed thing. Um, and so you'll see it's got the primary keys here. So these, these keys, even though you don't, you don't have to specify them, you know, in the data joint language, because it knows if, you, if this table inherits from the scan ID and the scan inherits from the session, and the session inherits from the subject, all of those keys are always added and propagated. So like you've got an index in your database that is indexing all of these things. But what's really cool about it is that it, it, it always, this is part of what ties together this whole sort of, this whole pipeline and guarantees your integrity all the way through. So like when you're all the way down looking at the very like, uh, you know, synthesized results, every one of those things will still tie back to you know, its parent tables, and often you'll see the primary keys in there still, so you'll have the subject. And one of the things that's very cool that we're adding like in the next sprint is you can actually pick a subject um, or a session and then like filter the entire pipeline and see like out of your, you know, whatever terabytes of data, just the slice that corresponds to one particular, you know, one particular animal or one particular um, ex recording session or something cool. Something cool happened. All right, so let's see. How are we on time? Just a quick time check. We've got about 35 minutes. Oh, boy, this is great. Okay, well. Then, then we have to all hightail it out of here. We have to oh, hightail right. it? Yeah. Okay. Well, so I've shown you this. So like one of the things that's like, this is like one of our best innovations right here. This is a business model innovation that, that I, like, I helped come up with. One of the things that we, we had, uh, the company was like, we were doing services and just consulting like software, helping labs set up pipelines using the open source tools. And then um, with, we got a grant 18 months ago and last, late last year we launched the works, um, the, like the managed services. So we built the back end and we started running all of these like jobs and pipelines for customers. And we were basically like at, at, in the early days doing that, we were operating like as a tax on top of the Amazon cloud. So right, like I mean, there's a big giant cost for Amazon Cloud. We're trying to guess what it is. You know, it was somewhere around fifteen to twenty-five dollars per hour of recorded data for certain for like one one of those probes, one of those three hundred eighty-four uh, Electra probes. That was costing us yeah fifteen to twenty bucks an hour for the uh, GPU time, CPU time, and um, we did a ton of optimization on it, which was very cool. We actually like split up the CPU and GPU tasks, and, like did all the GPU stuff. Uh, separately, which was tricky. We had to take apart a bunch of like open source code that our customers were using and kind of refactor it a bit. But um, anyway, what we discovered was with that model in the business, um, 
our customers, we couldn't give them very much flexibility. And you know, scientists, if they're, whoa, this is not very stable. Scientists, um, sometimes they prize their flexibility. If they're running an operation, it's like what we were talking about where, okay, I'm, I'm uh, training the model and now I'm executing the model. It's just like I'm in ops mode and I'm running tons of data through it. If you're in an operational kind of a mode where you're just gonna gather the same data from 10,000 different experiments, okay, it's probably gonna run pretty, pretty consistently. But um, a lot of science is still in this mode where you're gonna run a bunch and then do some evaluation and then change things and run some more and there's a lot of change. You might change the parameters. You might come up with, oh, there's a new version of you know, Killisort. Now there's one that, actually there's a new, new one that's coming very soon, which is uh, uh, moving from MATLAB to Python. It's much more GPU cloud friendly that we're excited about. And um, uh, so what happened was we had to tie our customers' hands. Because like, if they were able to just go add whatever arbitrary code they wanted to their pipelines, well, we have no idea what the compute cost is going to be. And so then we either have to figure out how do we meter that or do we upcharge it or whatever. Because we were basically trying to keep it simple and give them off like a flat rate. So we would always lose money whenever they wanted to do more, you know, reprocessing the data, change the parameters. And so basically we figured out how to attack this with like a bring your own cloud um, solution. So basically we got out of the business of like upcharging, you know, Amazon. And like we're like there's a subscription for our software, and we can build your Amazon account if you want to use EC2 and uh, S3. And we're very very good at managing those costs. We're way better at managing those costs than like the labs are themselves. So that's that's kind of cool. So that's where we're at now. And then we're actually a lot of these labs have their own you know big clusters with, mm -hmm. uh, and some of them have lab, like machines in the lab. Like I mean, one of the labs I was talking about. Um, one of the big labs, one of the really high-end labs, with some of the AI research, like they've got some massive GPU machines. I mean, they're spending half a million bucks a year or a couple of years on computers just that are sitting in the lab and big storage units and stuff. So they've invested in all this equipment and, you know, so there's a number of these customers telling us like, hey, we've already invested in all this equipment. Why should we pay Amazon? We'd rather give you the money and make it work on our equipment. And, They'd rather not give us the money. Right? They'd rather keep it, spend it on their, their grad students and stuff. So that's actually what we want to do. We were actually moving towards this, you know, bring your own compute or storage, and it's cloud or not. Don't really care. Um, so yeah, so this is this is fun. This is a little bit about our um, architecture. I'm not sure it's very interesting. We're going to skip it. All right. So this is the last thing here, and then I'm going to talk about like the level five stuff because it's what's really cool. So, like most labs today are in, down in here, you know, very ad hoc, a lot of, you know, bespoke development and just, you know, you've got a problem, you write code that's very specific to solving that problem and it's very fragile and brittle and breaks and, you know, it doesn't last. Um, as you get more management in the lab, you start to see more, like, actual quality control. You know, you have some metrics that you're looking at for you know, your, your processes and you're also, like, You've got specialists like, oh, great! We've got enough of a lab or enough, you know, enough people that there's one guy that does all the signals engineering, and he goes from, you know, across multiple things like that. And then um, we're just some some labs are just getting into this territory and, and up a little bit where you're now um, working on this question of fair, which is uh, an acronym from NIH, which is um, no, what is it? Flexible? I don't. I'm not going to try and say what fair is. My mind is in a different direction right now. But FAIR is basically, hey, we want our data to be, you know, accessible and um, reliable and um, available. Okay, the uh, scalable workflows and, um, and then this magical realm of closing the discovery. This is where, like, what DataJoin is doing today is we're taking labs that are down here and our software is, like, leaping them over all these levels of levels of immaturity, most of them to here, and then with the new grant we're applying for in January that we're uh, going to be working on with a couple of schools, probably Stanford, we're going to be actually creating, like productizing this. There's some labs that are actually operating at this level um, using data joint and a lot, of their, a lot of their own innovation around it, and like that's what's really cool. So that's what I want to show you. So this is, uh, this is probably where I'm going to wind up. This is um, what's called the inception loop. And this is done in um, Andreas uh, Tolias' lab at Baylor College of Medicine. They're one of the, there's a couple of labs in the world that have been collaborating on this. 
And so here we have a primate. Not human, because we're not allowed to do this with humans yet. But, you know, Elon Musk might, you know, customize those neural links to give us some extra capabilities. That could be very, very interesting. But, okay, so we've got a primate, and we show it images, right? So it's looking at, you know, whatever, picture of a dog. All right, and then, um, and, and it'll look at pictures or um, movies or whatever, whatever the stimulus is. It's looking at these images for about an hour. And then the next 15 minutes is this heavy-duty GPU-intensive computation, which we call spike sorting, which is usually the kilosort algorithm. And this is the thing that's taking all of these hundreds of electrodes and all those signals and identifying the, the cells that are firing in the sequence of like the pattern and sort of roughly where those are happening. So it's doing this spike sorting and analyzing this data set. Okay, so now, we have five minutes and we get to train the models. So here we're training a model that is like looking at the, uh, the cells that are activating in and, and looking at that like in correlation with the images, the stream of images that were shown. Right? So you're looking at the images and maybe, maybe you end up with a theory, maybe this model uh, training actually, and obviously there's a bunch of, you know, a human has written some code to like ask the right, you know, prompt the model to go in the right direction. But like, let's say you're looking for, let's say you have a theory about, um, maybe there's a cell or a set of cells that identify like a, a sharp diagonal line in the upper left corner of vision, something like that. These are the kinds of things the brain does. It makes no sense, but it does. Um, I could be wrong about that, but that's the kind of thing that, that you might have a hypothesis. Let's say we have a hypothesis that these, you know, six cells or these 600 cells all kind of activate in this sequence. You see this and it kind of, they kind of activate in the same sequence as like this line that shows up in the video. Okay, so the models get trained, it'll select these neurons, and then it actually will generate, um, it generates uh, these, these masks. So it's basically like creating a hypothesis about how is the vision, like the sensory input, how is it getting processed, which cells are doing what. And so it actually now generates new images and it creates new video, and then it goes back and it plays it back to your um, your primate. And now it's watching all of this, and it's got you know some of the natural images mixed in, right? So you've got controls, and you've got the generated these things. These generated images just look like like optical illusions almost. They're very weird, right? But you're interspersing these things, and now what you're doing is recording again. And um, in, this, in this closed loop, right, now this can actually potentially repeat, too, depending on the monkey and its patience and, you know, stuff. But basically, what's, this is like a very first, this is one loop, but um, we're looking at, like, how can we make this loop faster? And how can we make uh, this work with, you know, all different kinds of contexts? And, you know, it could be, it could be that you're, you're doing this with, like, visual processing, but it could also be... Um, hey, we've got a, a, a mouse and it's really groggy and we're going to just do video of its behavior, but we're going to keep stimulating it in different ways and actually see what it responds to differently. There's a million different kinds of experience you can imagine with this. And so this is really like, to me, this is the heart of the like kind of cutting edge where the science, uh, the psyops and the kinds of questions that we're asking are meeting the AI because like you know, really like figuring out how do you train these models and generate, uh, you know, these kinds of images and do it like in real time. I mean, we would love to do, you know, we would love to do this, right? This is, you're talking about 30 minutes of uh, work just to get here and another 15 to like, uh, to, to build these in, right? So, um, you know, how can we do this faster? What's the right combination of, you know, cloud and on-prem and, what we're, what we're looking at building is sort of a data joint edge uh, um, system, software system that can actually manage all that stuff on the edge and you know, allow you to have kind of arbitrary flexibility With on the images, computer. images, you generate mm -hmm. a lot of them, right? Mm -hmm. The masks. Yeah. So uh, what's the stopping from generating the first one and mm -hmm. you start the verification while generating the others? 
I think my understanding of that, I'm not the scientist in the lab, my understanding of that is that like um, the, the, uh, the monkey needs a break. Um, uh, so like it's okay that it takes a little time here, but you know, do we like one of the questions I have is like, well, would we, you know, I think maybe you're doing 60 minutes of exposure because the processing is going to take so long, but you know, what if you know, what if you did five minutes or 10 minutes of exposure and the processing could be very quick and then you could actually iterate multiple times. Maybe you would want to iterate this a hundred times, and you know, as long as the monkey is not going to be exhausted. You know, you can. I mean, if you look at this, the total experiment time is two and a half hours, um, and you know the, the the time that the the animals is you know, and I think they make this stuff kind of. I mean, I could you know, like from what I've seen, they make this stuff kind of kind of fun. It's like games, right? I mean, like I said, I don't know what it is. They somehow measured the the mice happiness, and they like they really loved the the Mad Max thing. So you know, I don't know, couldn't get enough of it. The the this is. Um, um, but this is what's like. This is what it looks like to try to actually like reverse engineer this incredibly complex circuit, right? Like you, yeah. you can't even. I mean, calcium imaging, like bringing calcium imaging and two photon or even three photon into this, where you can get these super detailed maps and know exactly like which neuron is is activating and what's its like what are its neighbors and its connections, where we can actually start to see those circuits, right? Here you can infer stuff about the circuit. The spike sorting stuff is very sophisticated. Way beyond me, but that's that's th those are things where you have like some ability to see the patterns of, of things that go together. But I don't know that you really get the physical like connect connectivity when you're doing the spike sorting. But with calcium imaging, you're much closer to that because you actually have the physical you know the the, the complexity of the brain that you were referring mm -hmm. to in that that Nature magazine that's going to come out soon mm -hmm. and that one millimeter yeah how. How complex? How this is the did, how many how how dense is it in terms of neurons and 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 how complex is the architecture compared mm -hmm. to what we're doing now? Because we're we're, we're basically using our neuro, neural networks, right, to compose images mm -hmm. and then to sort of feed it through this yeah. other neural network, but the real one, mm -hmm. in, in order to reverse engineer it. I, I was just wondering. Oh, great. Right. Well, so here you go. So this is the Microns project. Yeah. Right. And so multi petabyte data set of co registered neurophysiological neuro neuroanatomical data. So it's a cubic millimeter, and that's 100,000 neurons. Mm -hmm. And there's this, like, there's a good image of, like, what that, what that mess mm -hmm. looks like. Uh, and there's actually this whole, you know, this whole explorer in here. Um, but like, so the number of oh wow, so yeah, so the number of edges that, that was right, 523 okay. million in the wow. I didn't see that number, but that sounds like right. So okay, now now we're into this realm of that's one of that's one of the neurons. Yeah, wow. I think is this so. Is this what? So yeah, data joint actually is powering a lot of all of the underlying. This is not this is not data joint. This is a this is like a web interface built on top of the um, of the Micron's uh, data set. But actually, like our CEO Dimitri's walking around with the Micron's data set on his laptop, and like our project for over the holidays is to put it up onto our just our demo server, and just get it, get it so we can start playing with it. So uh, yeah, we're very we're very close to putting this up like. This is going to probably be the first thing we put up in the. We can't actually like. I mean, this this explorer is like that's on their site, but um, because these are still not published, so they're being very careful about what data they're releasing. But when that Nature article comes out, by then we should have. Um, fingers crossed. By then, I'm hoping that we are going to have the entire Microns data set on our um, on our platform and have Amazon kind of. Posting the storage for it and actually do like a big, you know. That, that's a specific neuron right there. I'm I believe on that. That's the other neuron. Yeah, because this is this is yeah. the idea, right? The idea of microns is that you've got like the electron microscopy, which is this, yeah. and then you've got, you know, over here, like the sig the signals, the functional data of where signals travel. 
Now I can't exactly t you know tell you how to navigate this since I've never yeah, that's, that's nice. gone too deep into it. I, I mean that's crazy that that's yeah. just one millimeter. Yeah, that's I mean the crazy. millimeter is you know. Okay, so now we're talking <laughs> the size of your millimeter, and there it is. Right, it's like stars in the sky, it's nuts. Right, so, <laughs> kind of cool. It even works over Wi-Fi. I mean, that's like, how, how, is, how do we live in this magical world? I just love it. I don't know, what do you guys think of this stuff? I mean, this is like not your typical AI or ML ops. This is like... One of the things that's weird and cool to me is that all this, you know, this computer right here, this computer is not running very fast. You know, you're not, you're not getting kilohertz or megahertz or gigahertz uh, clock speeds in the brain. There's also a lot of weird analog stuff going on in there, which we don't even, we try not to think about that. We think it's, we like to pretend it's digital because it simplifies all the understanding of the models. But, you know, it's, uh, it's insanely complicated and yet, like, there is like there's more hope to, and promise today of actually learning things that we can then, you know, partly it's like understanding, but also, you know, can we actually inform the code that we're writing, you know, the AI algorithms that we're developing? Like, what's you know, we're still all working off of the, uh, uh, you know, the the big innovations from like 2012 in LLMs, right? And just now getting systems that are caught catching up to being able to process, you know. You've got all the big, all the big tech guys spending fortune on processing all of the data on the web or whatever their their, their, their uh, subjects are, but the uh, you know the training sets. But I mean, I'm sure there's a lot of research going on. I just don't know about it. About like, okay, well, what's next after large language models and this type of AI? And uh, hopefully, we'll learn some stuff here that helps. I mean, it's a, it's, a, it's an amazing presentation because. We're just looking at the size of how enormous it is, yeah. just from this one millimeter. But that's just static. And 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 what the science yeah. experiments are is the dynamics of exactly. that. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. And that's like exactly even because yeah, it's right. it's you know you've got. <laughs> I mean, fortunately, the brain is not going at four gig four gigahertz. Like, how would you you know if you were looking at an Intel chip and trying right. to track the electrons and right. figure exactly. out. How, okay, well, what, you know, oh, obviously this is, this is running Minecraft, you know, like you're not going to get that by looking at the, you know, electron microscopy of the, of your, of your Pentium or, you know, even an old Pentium, right? right? You're not going to, even a, geez, you know, you're, you're not going to, you're just not going to ever get that. That's but, you know, there's a, there's a whole art of, like reverse engineering is just a real art. It's a very weird, you know, it's the same kind of skills you use when you're like debugging, trying to figure out why is this going wrong? And especially in the realm of, when you're talking about AI ML, there's a lot of non-deterministic stuff. And when you're talking about giant, you know, cloud systems where even just observability, I mean, we spent how many conversations working on observability in our systems, right? Those are hard, uh, hard to do in, you know, fairly deterministic and well-behaved uh, systems. So, yeah, this is all wet. I mean, there's, uh, there's, there's, there's really no hope. I guess the thing is like, okay, there's really no hope. There's certainly no hope if you're, you know, using sneaker net to move your files around and don't have really good data models. Or post-it notes. Or post-it notes on, the, post -it notes on <laughs> the mouse page, exactly, right? Because like, you don't know, okay, was that Bill or Bob the mouse? Or, you know, or, or, or Betty and, you know, Honestly, like you screw up the name of the mouse or the ID of the mouse on the data set and, you know, you're ending up correlating one brain with another and like, okay, all bets are off. You're not going to have anything that makes sense. You might find some great breakthroughs, but they're going to be false, right? So this is where like this fundamental data integrity is like, it's, it's like more critical in these, in these systems than I think, you know, I don't know, maybe anywhere. Banking, right? Banking is pretty important. I kind of think about it. it's Christmas, right? You guys know the film, Miss, uh, not Mr. Smith. What's the other? Um, Jim Stewart. Life. It's a Wonderful Life. Mm -hmm. You know the film, It's a Wonderful Life, right? right. Remember the Bailey Building and Loan? Mm -hmm. 
right? And you know, the bank inspector is coming, right? And Uncle Billy, he's got like all the f strings trying to remember. This is before they had you know, Adderall for Uncle Billy. But like, uh, he's got strings tied around his fingers to remember all the things. And he's got like the $10,000, right? He's, he was supposed to go deposit and he can't remember where he put it. And Mr. Potter takes it, whatever. But the, uh, you know, that model of how to run a bank, you know, it actually worked. It was nothing wrong with it. It worked for the Bailey Building up until the, the banking crisis, you know, and uh, in, in the depression, all that, what happened with Potter and the bank examiner and all. Like up until that time, the Bailey Building Loan worked pretty pretty nicely. Everybody was friendly, got along, and collaborated. You know, the people in the office trusted Uncle Billy, even though they knew he was a little bit loose with the uh, details sometimes. And it was fine. And you know, paper records in the bank. You know, banks. You know, you can imagine like you know, the big paper ledgers where they're keeping your account balance. Right? Did you guys? Are you guys? Any of you guys? Uh, ever keep like you know you have a, che a physical checkbook and you got that little ledger where you gotta like write in every check you write and and do the math, right? How reliable is that? Not not great. But what, imagine if the whole banking system right. was run by like you had to like fax in a copy of your ledger every month and they would like you know look at it and say yeah sure that's your balance, and you know you'd have no hope of ever having like sensible data. Could you put a credit card system on top or an ATM system on top of like the Bailey building and loan, right? I mean, this is ridiculous, right? So, but that's like, that's kind of where we're at with science. They're not quite that bad, but they're mostly at this level where every lab has figured out something that kind of works for them. And some are better than others, but there's like, there's really no, like there's no way to do data interchange. So one of the things that I think is kind of cool about this is like with data joint, we actually have a language for expressing data models and a scientific pipeline that the more labs use it, and like I said, we've got about 100 using it today. Um, the, more the more people use like a common language, we can at least like tie things, tie things together. And really the, the, the cool thing I think is gonna happen in the next year is that we're starting to work, we're working with labs where we've got these collaborations. There's one we're doing with Stanford, Berkeley, and Harvard, and a couple other labs in, um, in that mix. And they're all gonna adopt the same pipeline with the same data models and do different like research with it, but with the same, you know, all the same kind of keys. And what that's gonna open up then is like, oh, now they can all of a sudden, they can share data because they've structured all the under, all that stuff, the subject and the session and all those, all the stuff that builds up so that you can actually put metadata with whatever the brain images are. Like, all, they're all gonna be using the same structure for that. And like, ooh, now what does that make possible? And then, you know, the craziest thing, last thing I'm gonna say, the craziest thing about this world, I think, is that if you go to a big lab, there's labs where they've got like 30 postdocs and grad students and one principal investigator. And all labs have a you know, big name, like the Andres Talias lab, or you know, where maybe, right? You go to a big lab, and there's a, you know, a couple dozen or more people that are working on the different parts of the experiment. Some of them are lab techs, some work with the animals, some are working on the lasers, some of them are, you know, there's engineers doing that, some of them are software people. There's not too many really great software engineers because they don't pay enough. And, you know, we'll pay them more over here uh, on, the, on the techie side. But, um, like, one of our, one of our um, labs will report at, the, at Penn. They got 30 students in the lab, they've got 18 pipelines, 18 different, like, processes. You know, every single one of those 18 is run completely different. There's nothing in common. They don't even use the same, like, data model for how do you, like, represent a mouse. Like, it's just different because everybody rolls their own because, because why? There's, like, there's nothing. There's, it's never even been possible for them to exchange or share data. And everybody thinks it's a great idea, but it's just too much work. And so part of the idea is, like, if we can make it all really easy, then guess what? We'll call it a cool... You know, what might come from that? I don't know, I, I really don't know what's gonna come from it, but I think we have to solve that, like, that fundamental basic problem of just get people, like, not adopting variety for variety's sake, you know? Like, really, does your mouse pick name, you know, is it a name or a number? Like, pick one, doesn't matter. But like, you know, do something consistently and, you know, name your sessions by the date or name your sessions by, you know, the name of the researcher and the date or whatever. But like. Don't just stick it in the file name or the folder name and then hope that somebody uses the same folder, you know, file folder structure 
down the hall from you and that you can ex exchange and share data. That's the other piece of this we didn't even talk about is that a lot of this data, some of it's in the database, a lot's in file systems with sort of sometimes arbitrary naming and folder structures and stuff. And so a big part of, a big part of like the next, uh, next few months is actually um, we're going to be investing a whole bunch in the file structure and like we're looking at parquet files and a lot of cool tech and what can we do to, you know, more, uh, bring more sophistication um, and flexibility. Uh, so anyway, that's, any questions or thoughts? Yeah, we're good. You it's mentioned cool. that the way uh, it's a structure that you change a piece of data and they put in a pipeline where the code itself processes it, like everything that's based on downstream dependency should be updated on that. That's good, but then how do you track also for audibility's sake the inputs going into it? So mm -hmm. what the human goes and flips a bit for the inconvenient outlier or mm -hmm. you know, just the code, mm -hmm. that would in theory itself be audible even if the rest of it is automatically recalculated. Yeah. Um, if they flip a bit in a database table or in a like a raw data file off on the server or what? Uh, technically either. Okay. So in the data files, a lot of times those are stored in a you know read-only and checksums way. Mm -hmm. So like the raw data files coming off of your your lab equipment, you know, would be, they're also compressed. We're, we actually, they're not yet. We have a ton of lo new lossless compression that we're introducing into that realm. And so the compression is actually, one of the things you get with that is uh, validation, you know, and checksums and stuff. So, so actually like keeping that data tight and, you know, uh, uh, knowing that it hasn't been uh, modified by whatever cosmic rays or whatever it may be, right? Or, you know, a, a person messing with it. So you've got that. And then on the data in the database, um, actually what we do is most of the data, metadata is immutable. And so you actually have to, if you have a mouse and you've like uh, uh, made some fundamental error in its basic metadata, um, you most likely have to actually delete the mouse and create a new one. Mm. And that's, that's the safest way. So that mouse, basically, you like, you know, clone, clone the record but fix what you need to. And what happens is, okay, now that mouse with that ID no longer exists and everything downstream also gets wiped out. But because of the way data jump works, that's not that big of a pain because, oh, I've added a new mouse and now I've got a, you know, I've got subject, if I, if I, if I eliminated subject number, you know, 32, Right, and now I've added a new subject which has got like the same name, but I had its birth date wrong. So like its age was off. Let's say I, I put in, you know, 19, 1999 instead of 1989. This is a really old mouse, but whatever. You put in a, the, the birth date and you've made a typo, right? So what happens is when you delete the mouse like ID 32, right? Every downstream record with subject ID 32 gets invalidated and deleted. And then when I now add in this mouse again, and it's now it's ID 74, right, replacing that mouse, automatically all those downstream tables that have a dependency, the, the, the next step in the pipeline, has a dependency on the subject. It says, oh, there's a new subject, subject ID 74, and it doesn't have a subject and session like uh, correlation, so I'm gonna go and calculate, create that record. So this is basically the way it works, is that like when you have a table that's a computed table, if there, if any new data shows up, like you got this, the easiest one to see is a parameter set. So if I have like three parameter sets and I say, oh, I want to try a new set. If I add parameter set four, unless I, unless I do something to turn off the automation, it'll take every session and now it'll apply parameter set four and do a new computation of all those downstream tables. So you'll have every permutation of session and parameter set. And so that's automatic and that's kind of, those two things together are what get you the kind of the guaranteed. Essentially, source data is trees immutable and checked some, so you can't go and corrupt that. And if you do, yeah. you basically blow away the downstream. The rest can be recomputed. Yeah, I mean, on a, like as a DevOps kind of DevOps psyops question, if you know, it can be very expensive, right? Like if you're talking about, you know, if you're talking about 15, 20 bucks per recording hour for all that processing, right? You know, if you did that times a thousand mice for multiple hours of recording, it's going to add up, right? So what um, what we often do is we will like if the customer wants to delete a record or modify a record, like on our back end, we can modify, we can modify things, we can enable them to do it too, but usually we have like a, a cross check 
where they'll say, hey, we want to make this modification. It's not scientifically relevant. We misspelled, you know, Bob. We actually put two Bs in it's only one or whatever. I don't know. It's three Bs instead of two. I don't know. Misspelled Bob, whatever it was. Not scientifically relevant. Um, we can make those changes. But there's also then an audit trail in the communications about that. So we're still able to provide that. All right. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Thanks for the, thanks for the opportunity to to share. I'm, um, I'm excited. Hopefully, we all get to work together on this. Yeah, run out of here. All right, I'm gonna drop you my Yeah, yeah, I'll do it. Wait, we gotta send a photo to Clay. Oh yeah, let's do it. When was the last time you dropped it? Oh, you know. Um, we, uh, let's see, I was trying to get him a, there's a, a, a my son Zach, my son Zach, the other Zach, um, is working for a really cool company in uh, Brooklyn that is, um, in, you know the, you know the movie The Game? Yeah. Uh, it's basically creating the game uh, in a dark sci-fi uh, world. And so it's this game where they, um, where, where they like invade your life with the game. So the way that it's kind of like, I don't know, that's, that's sort of their mode. It's very kind of very interesting theatric. Right? Lots of stuff. Awesome. And they're looking to hire like this insane head, uh, like guerrilla marketing. Like they're really for head of marketing. I thought like, oh, this sounds like Clegg. Oh yeah. So 